Hello and uh, a good day to all. The topic assigned to us is value and the quest for the good. In our book, this is chapter four, value and the quest for the good. Our lesson, actually, this chapter begins with a very interesting uh, quotation from John uh, Laird, a study in realism. It says, there is beauty in the sky and cloud and sea in lilies and in sunsets, in the glow of bracken, in autumn, and in the enticing greenness of the leafy spring. Nature indeed is infinitely beautiful, and she seems to wear her beauty as she wears color or sound. So why then should her beauty belong to us rather than to her? That's a nice question to ask. Human character and human dispositions have value, or worth which belongs to them in the same sense as redness belongs to cherry. Another another quotation with Benedict de Spinoza in, in the book Ethics, we never strive for or wish for or long for because we deem it to be good, but take note of this, but rather we deem a thing good because we strive for it, we wish for it and long for it and desire for it. Did you get the, did you get the idea? We never strive, we never wish for, long for, or, or desire anything because we deem it to be good, but rather we deem a thing, a thing good because we strive for it and we long for it and we desire for it. So the question, what, are, what, what do you think are the valuable things to you? What, what things, uh, what, what, are, what are the things that you think are valuable things to you? It's a nice question to ask actually. Is it a car, a house, a land? Your laptop, your cell phones, gadget, shoes, jewelry, property. They say human life is most valuable. That's what they say. Human life has the absolute value of, of all, really. Is human life really has, has the absolute value? Let's say I have a convenience, a convenience machine. It's found in your, in your book, actually, if you... If you read uh, the the PDF file of this, let's say there's a, a a machine that gives you convenience that will give you enormous, um, it, it will save you an enormous time, uh, enormous amount of time and effort to make your 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 daily chores, your life really easy. Would you use the machine? Of course, you will say yes. But yeah, it's a time saver. Because it's a energy saver. You will say yes if you, you want to use it. If they ask you if you want to use it. But I should say, but this time machine is going to cost 75,000 lives of Americans. Would you still use the machine? It would cost death to over 75,000 American lives per year. Then you, you, you might probably, probably change your mind. Okay. No, it's a convenience machine, but it's going to cost lives. No. But it's good for the economy. Or else the economy will, will have depression, will have uh, economic, uh, uh, e economic collapse if we won't use it. But still, I know you will. No, I don't care. Even if the economy is going to collapse, it's going to cost lives of people. So I'm not going to use. I'm, I know that's what's, what's in your mind. You would always say no. But do you know that we're using it now? It's a convenience machine. In fact, I'm in one of them. Our cars. Chevrolet, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, Mercedes, Isuzu. What else? Honda. You know that cars are the cause of for like 45,000 deaths per year just because of accidents? And another 30,000 because of pollution. But why are we using it if we really de uh, if really think that life has an absolute value? So <laughs> it's nice something to think about. You know, according to uh, according to Nicholas uh, Rescher, uh, introduction to value to the value of theory. Uh, there's the the basic values can be classified into eight c categories according to according to him in his book Introdu introduction to value theory. Uh, the material, physical value, economic value, moral value, social value, political value, aesthetic value, religious value, intellectual value. These are 
all the values although it's very hard no it's really hard to to make a full list of what what are the valuable things in life it's going to take forever for you to list down but this uh, nicholas actually categorize all the value basic values just the basic values into eight the material and physical value are health of course health is valuable comfort or physical security economic value of course product productiveness economy of a country or income moral value honesty fairness of course kindness to to everyone social value generosity politeness graciousness Political value, we need freedom. It's, oh, that's a value to us. Justice. Aesthetic value, beauty, symmetry. Oh, grace. Religious value, obedience, our faith. That's one of the values. One, one category. Intellectual value, or intelligence, or knowledge. That's why we go to school. So, before I proceed to the next uh, uh, so to continue the discussion, I should say, um, I have uh, my companion in our group. He's going to discuss to, to us a very interesting topic about the intrinsic and instrumental value, huh? and uh, the value of pleasure. The value of pleasure. So, let's give him the time. Good day everyone, I am Henry Jones Balasan Salvani and I was assigned to report two topics the intrinsic and instrumental value and the value of pleasure. Intrinsic and instrumental value Intrinsic goods are goods because of their nature and are not derived from other goods. By contrast, instrumental goods are worthy of desire because they are effective means of attaining our intrinsic goods. The fundamental difference between intrinsic and instrumental value is that intrinsic value is valued for its own sake, whereas instrumental value is valued for the end result gained from it. Plato made distinction in his book The Republic where the characters Socrates and Glaucon are talking. This is the conversation of Socrates and Glaucon. What things are good and val valuable? Socrates distinguish three kinds of goods. First is purely intrinsic goods of which simple choices are an example. Purely in instrumental goods of which medicine and making money are examples. And the third is combination goods such as knowledge, sight, and health which are good in themselves are good as a means to further goods. We may further distinguish an instrumental good from good instrument. If something is an instrumental good, it means to attaining something that is intrinsically good, but merely to be a good instrument is to be an effective means to any goal, goal, good or bad. The Republic mentions two instrumental values. The first is medicine and the second is money. In medicine, medication is a useful asset that is rarely cherished for its own sake. Some would agree with Socrates that health is beneficial by itself. I swear, as for the things like enjoyment and intellectual activity, others who disagree with Socrates and consider health to be a, just a rational benefit. In money, Socrates also uses money as an example of an instrumental value. Few, if any of us appreciate money in and of itself but virtually Everyone values money for what it can purchase. The most common response to Socrates' example of an intensive good satisfaction or pleasure. It is good to experience pleasure and bad to experience pain. The intrinsicalist affirms that pleasure is just better than pain. We can see this straight off. We do not need any arguments to convince us that pleasure is good or that gratitude's pain is intrinsically bad. The non-intrinsicalist denies that the preceding arguments have any force. The notion that the experience itself could have any value is unclear. It is only by our choosing pleasure over pain that the notion of value begins to have meaning. 
The freedom to create our values thus to define ourselves is God-like and at the same time deeply frightening for we have no one to blame for our failures but ourselves. We are condemned to freedom. Value is nothing else but the meaning that you choose one may choose anything so long as it is done from the ground of freedom. Sartre's condition for choosing a value of freedom is that it is imposing us to nature rather than one that we choose. We might sacrifice our freedom for other value, but we can choose whether or not to appreciate it. It's as if God or evolution pre-program are your name for certain essentials. And when we find someone who does not value or claims not to value happiness, freedom, or love, we tend to explain this anomaly as a product of unfortunate circumstances. Let us proceed to our next topic, the value of pleasure. Philosophers divide into two broad camps, hedonist and non-hedonist. The hedonist from hedon, Greek word for pleasure. Sometimes this definition is widened to include the lessening of pain. Pain being seen as the only thing bad in itself. For simplicity's sake, we will use the former definition realizing that it may need to be supplemented by reference. Hedon is subdivided into two categories, sensualism, the view that equates all pleasure with sensual enjoyment, satisfactionism, the view that equates all pleasure with satisfaction or enjoyment, which may not involve sensuality. Satisfaction is a pleasurable state of consciousness such as we might experience after accomplishing a successful venture or receiving a gift. The opposite of sensual enjoyment is physical pain. The opposite of Satisfaction is displeasure or dis The Greek philosopher Aristippus espoused the sensuality position that is, the only good was sensual pleasure, and this goodness was defined in terms of its intensity. Mustafa Mons, Philosophy in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World The Brave New World is a society of future where people have been liberated from disease, violence, and crime through immunization, genetic engineering, and behavior of modification. Mustafa Mond, the brilliant manager of the society, defends this hedonistic utopia against one of the few remaining malcontents, the savage, who complains the some, that something of value is missing in this utopia. The distinction between pleasure as satisfaction as sensation in, is important and failure to recognize it results in confusion and paradox. How can it be that Master Cheats enjoys that is takes pleasure in pain, which is the opposite of pleasure? Well, the hedonist responds because of certain psychological aberrations. Master Cheats enjoys what is painful, but he or she does not enjoy what is painful. There is also two-level analysis to explain the Master Cheats behavior. On a lower or basic level, he is experiencing either pain or dissatisfaction, but on a higher level, he approves and finds satisfaction from that pain or dissatisfaction. Non-hedonists divide into two camps. First is monist and the second is pluralist. Monists believe in a single inheritant value which is not pleasure. Perhaps it is a transcending value the good that we do not completely know but does, but that serves as the foundation for all our other values. This appears to be Plato's point of view. Pluralists typically acknowledge that pleasure or enjoyment is an intrinsic good. They also acknowledge that there are other intrinsic goods such as knowledge, friendship, aesthetic, beauty, freedom, love, moral, excellence, and life itself. The hedonist asks what are friendship and love for. If we were made differently, if we were differently and got no satisfaction out of love and friendship, would they still be valuable? Are they not highly valuable, significant instrument goods because they bring enormous satisfaction? The hedonist claims that even moral commit commitment, conscientiousness, isn't beneficial in and of itself. Morality is not fundamentally useful. Rather, 
it is intended to meet a human need, which is to be satisfied. And life certainly is intrinsically good. It is quality that counts an amoeba or permanently comatose patient has life but no intrinsic value. Only when consciousness appears does not possibility for value arrive. Consciousness is necessary but not a sufficient condition for satisfaction. The non-hedonist respond that this is a consider, for example, the possibility of living in a pleasure machine. We have invented a complex machine into which people may enter to, the, to find pure and constant pleasure. Attached to their brains will be electrodes that send current to the limbic area of the cerebral cortex and other parts of the brain, producing very powerful sensation of pleasure. When people get into the machine, they experience these wonderful feelings. Would you enter such a machine? The pleasure machine appears to be best option if you all seek in is pleasure or fulfillment. You'll get all the pleasure you ever desire, with none of the frustration or rivalry from others. However, if you want to do something and be something, for example, have excellent character or a specific personality characteristics, or experience reality, for example, friendship and com competitiveness, you should reconsider your decision. Socrates stated that there were several types of pleasure, and those who had experienced them could discern between them. It's debatable if the concept of high quality can salvage Hinduism, yet many of us are uncomfortable with it. The notion that pleasure is sufficient some overarching concepts such as happiness or a more appropriate choice for what we understand by value appears to be an object or desire. So thank you so much Henry Jones for that very interesting discussion. So now let me ask you a question. It's a very interesting question actually. Is value are values objective or subjective? So let me... Are values objective or subjective? Or another question, do we desire good because it is good? Or is, it, is good good because we desire it? You get the question? <laughs> it's very nice, right? Do we desire good because it is good? Or is good good It's because we desire it? You know, there, there are two opinions, objectivist and subjectivist. The objectivist would say, um, good is that it's the highest form. No matter we desire it or not, it's good. It's godlike. It's independent. That's according to Plato. In his book, The Republic. Good is good when it's independent whether we desire it or not. The smoothness of the table, let's say. There's, there's a table. It's very smooth. Right? And the smooth, the, 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 the table is smooth no matter how, no matter if we touch it or not, no matter, no matter if there's human intervention. But the subjectivist will say, no, the atoms combined with your, with our human, human touch that makes this, the table smooth. It's because humans touch it. That's why the table is smooth. So what about you? Is the good good because we desire it, or no? Whether we like it, whether we desire it or not, it's good is good. The stronger the desire, they say, the better the value. The greater the value. That's what the subjectivist would say. That's why NFTs are very, very famous today. People desire for NFTs. That's why the value is getting higher. The objectivist would say, no. It's different. Whether you or not you desire it, no, it's not. Uh, it, it's still good. So, what are you? An objectivist or a subjectivist? Now, let's discuss the relationship of value to morality. Is there a relationship? You know, there's a, there's a chart. This is what we call a schema of moral process. In the schema, you can actually see uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Number three, it's the, the values. It's the central 
domain, the central to the domain of morality. It affects your principles, your judgment, your decision, and your action. Of course, it affects the forms of life and the rational justification. Let's talk about values. The value of life. Let's say the value of life. Um, when, you have, when you have that value of life, then it forms your principle. From three, you go up to four. It forms your principles of preserving life. In the Bible, it says, thou shalt not kill. If you, value fr- if you value freedom, then it forms a principle of freedom. That's why we take care of freedom. Happiness. If, you're, if, your values, if, you have, if you value happiness, if happiness is valuable to you, I mean, you have, that's why you, make, you, you strive hard to be happy and you make others happy. You make the community happy. Your principles of protecting happiness. Now, your values affects your principles. And your principles would affect your judgment. From the values, you obtain principles, and principles, you make judgments. And in judgments, you, after making judgments, you make decisions. And it all starts from the core values you have. And the value, for the values, it, you know, of course, you make principles and principles, judgments and judgments, you make decisions. Then, that's the time you make actions based on the decisions that you made. But, the interesting part is that there are failures along the way. Of course, yes, you, you, you say, yeah, you have values, values of life, values of honesty. Then that those values would turn into principles. And the principles, sometimes we make failures. Ah, my principle is not, I have to be honest. But of course, my judgment, I need to do something to cheat a little bit or to be dishonest a little bit. That's why lawyers will say, so I, my friend, my lawyer friends would say, you have to tell a little lie to tell the whole truth. I don't know. Yeah, this, these are failures <laughs> from principles to judgment. That's why it affects your decision. Failures of decision. And of course, it would lead to um, a failure of action. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Sometimes our values are good, but we fail to apply the right principles. Or sometimes we, we make right decisions, we, I don't know, we, 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 we apply right principles, but sometimes we fail in the application of our judgments. Or we may also make good judgments, yeah, but we fail to make the right choice as we make decisions. And will lead us sometimes to wrong actions, even though that's why, that's why there are failures along the way. And we make mistakes. Paul in Romans 7, 5 actually says, the good that I would, actually it's biblical, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil that I would not, I do. Yeah, that's according to Paul. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. And I know we can relate to all of it. All of us can relate to this. That's how life is. You know, the deepest question about morality is whether how these forms of life are justified. If you, if you see the chart, how, are these, how these forms of life are justified. Some, some forms of life, they say, are better, are more justified than others. And, you know, the values... And I mean, theists would say that the ideal system of morality is that being justified if you're commanded by God. By God. But utilitarian would, would say that they will argue, argue that uh, the ultimate criterion of uh, being justified is the promotion of welfare and utility. The naturalist would argue that the ideal system for morality is the promotion of human flourishing. But the main point of this schema is actually, 
It's not to, to decide exactly how deep the structure of morality is, but it's to indicate that the values are rooted in cultural constructs and the foundation, and this, these values are the foundation for moral principles. Now let's discuss the good life. So what kind of life, this, this is a question, what kind of life is worth living? What kind of life is worth living? Aristotle, he said, there is very general agreement for both the common person and the person of superior refinement. Say that it is happiness and identify living and identify living well and doing well with being happy. But with regard to what happiness, they differ. They differ, actually. Yeah. And many do not give the same account as the wise. For the former think it is some plain and obvious thing like pleasure, wealth, and honor. <laughs> Interesting. Again, what is happiness? Because we define, we have, we say the good life. It's, we, should, we, we should be happy. We should be, we live, we live in happiness. Having a good life. So let's ask the question. What is happiness? Again, there are three opinions. Objectivist versus the subjectivist. And of course, uh, versus the combination theorist, which is a mix of objectivist and subjectivist. Objectivists would argue that there's what we call a single ideal. Single ideal for human nature. If you don't reach that ideal, you fail. You're not happy. And every human being has a function. It's called essence. Essence. You have an essence to live according to reason. Thereby, thereby, you have to become of a, you, you have to become a certain sort of high rational, disciplined well-being for you to be happy. Plato even speaks that happiness is a harmony, is a harmony of the soul, just as the body is healthy when it's in, it, when it is in harmony with itself. But the subjectivist would say, there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of ways to find happiness. It states that happiness is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> and I am the only one who decides and knows whether I am happy. I feel happy, then I am happy. Subjectivists would argue that you are just as happy as you think you are. No more, no less. It's interesting, but the combination theorists, these are guys who mix the opinion. I mean, they, act, they actually incorporate both objectivist and subjectivist views. They say there's a plurality of life plans which is open to each person. So each person has the autonomy. Each person has the autonomy to choose which way he's going to obtain and to, I mean, to achieve happiness. It's interesting. There's a lot of ways. Again, there's we we have discussed the convenience machine, the pleasure machine. Now, what what if, what if we what if we change this into happiness machine? I have a happiness machine. Would you enter the happiness machine? And this happiness machine is wired with with a chip with uh, that is going to make you happy. It's going to make you happy forever. Would you enter the machine? Of course, a lot would say no. Some would say yes. Why not? But you can equate this machine. It's like a drug, actually. It's like a, you can say it's like a, um, like alcohol. You're not doing anything. Just enter the machine and you'll be happy. Something's missing, actually. Would you enter? Some may say yes. Some may say no. But it seems that something's missing, actually. For you to be happy, you need action. You need action. You're sitting in a machine, entirely passive, just a mere spectator and enjoying life. No, that's, that's pretty impractical. You need freedom. We, need, we, we want to do things. We need to be free to do things. That's for us to be happy. We need character. We need to be somebody. We need to be someone. We can act freely, but we need somebody as well. And we need relationships. We need relationships. For us to be happy. That's why I could say that the happiness machine, some may say they may enter, you may enter, yeah. But it takes action, it takes freedom, character, and relationships to be for to complete the picture of 
being, <laughs> of being happy. So that's it. That's for our discussion this afternoon. And thank you so much for listening. God bless.